Do you remember in section two, three, we used our calculator to find the mean, the median, the min, the max. It was the one variable statistic, we used that menu. Um, the same thing, that big long list of stuff, the calculator stood out. Um, it also gives us standard deviations too. So if you're doing your math Excel and you want to check your standard deviation, um, you can use the calculator to do it. You can put everything in list one um, and then use the one variable statistic under calculation to do this. Now, the calculator doesn't know if the data that you're putting in is from a population or from a sample. And the formulas are different because so one's n and one's n minus one. So you have to know when you get the, the readout here which value to select. If it's a sample, you're going to pick the one with the S, just like in our formulas. And if it's a population, you're going to pick a one with the lowercase thing, with the little plus here with the little tag on it. Okay, so both of those are standard deviation, sample versus population. Okay. All right. Okay, so let's talk about interpreting standard deviation. Some of this is not on your paper. We're just going to kind of talk through it a little bit, and then I'll tell you what you need to write down on there. All right, so standard deviation is the spread of our data. Um, and if we have a standard deviation of zero, like this first example, it means all of our data is really close together. It's zero standard deviations away from the mean. Um, it's a lot of times the phrase that we'll use, how many standard deviations away from the mean are we? So if we're zero standard deviations away from the mean, we are at the mean. All of our data is just one big column right in the middle at our mean value, at our um, average value. Um, then you can see as our standard deviation starts to get larger, our data starts to spread out further from the mean. So here in the middle, we've got a standard deviation of about 1.2. If we were to calculate it for this histogram, here we have a standard deviation of 3. So the mean is still in the middle at 5. If we were to calculate that average, you can see the data is a lot more spread out. So smaller the standard deviation, the more clumps the data. The larger the standard deviation, the more spread out the data. And if you're more standard deviations away from the mean, further away from the mean. Okay. All right. So big idea here. I would draw this picture somewhere, not on the one that you have on your paper there, just in the margin or somewhere else. Um, we're going to be putting some of these values on there in a little bit. Um, but a big idea in statistics is the empirical rule. Um, the empirical rule tells us approximately what percent of the data is within so many standard deviations of the mean. And we're doing it on a bell-shaped curve. Um, sometimes we'll call that a normal curve. Um, if it's not bell-shaped, not normal, we'll talk about what that would mean later. Most of the things we're going to do in this class are going to be bell-shaped, though. Okay, so when we say bell-shaped, we get this, this nice little symmetric picture here um, that has that hump in the middle. And your mean is right in that center, right in the middle of that. Okay. If we are within one standard deviation of the mean, to the left and to the right, 68% is within one standard deviation, okay, which means if we break that in half, 34 is on one side and 34 is on another side. If we are within two standard deviations of the mean, 95% is there. Okay, and we've already got the 68% in the middle, so that leaves us with 27%. Break that in half, that's 13 and a half, that's 13 and a half. And then finally, within three standard deviations is 99.7% of our data, which gives us 2.35 and 2.35 in those little two scales at the end. It's not 100% of our data. There's another 0.3% that's beyond three standard deviations. Um, but this accounts for the majority of our data. So in most cases, you are not dealing with standard deviations that are larger than three or smaller than negative three units from the mean. We say that a data value is unusual if it's more than two standard deviations from the mean. And that's the word our book uses, unusual. Okay, so anything that's in the little green areas or beyond is considered an unusual data value. Um, sometimes instead of the empirical rule, this is called the 68.95.99.7 rule. Those percentages are going to be important. Okay. 
At the bottom of this picture, you can see they're giving us all of our notations. We've got x bar in the middle for our sample mean, and then x bar plus and minus 1s, x bar plus and minus 2s, x bar plus and minus 3s, which represents 1, 2, and 3 standard deviations away, respectively. Everybody have what they need? Yeah? Okay. All right. So this is the first problem on your paper. So it says we have a set of data with a normal distribution, so that's our bell curve, a mean of 5.1, and the standard deviation is 0.9. We're going to find the percent of the data that is within each interval. And we've got a bell curve here. I'm going to go ahead and put my mean in the middle, and we can use actual numbers here instead of just variables. So what was my mean for this problem? 5.1. Okay, right in the center. That's always going to be where your mean is on a normal curve, on a bell curve. All right, then we have a standard deviation of 0.9. So those are marked in this picture. One standard deviation, two standard deviation. This one is almost at the bottom there, not quite. Think of the bell curve kind of like having asymptotes on either side. It's going to get really, really close to that axis, but it's not going to touch those axes. All right, and then we can label every 0.9 units is going to be one standard deviation. So if I take 5.1 and I add 0.9, I get 6. If I add 0.9 to that, I get 6.9. If I add 0.9 to that, I get 7.8. Okay, so I know what data value is located 1, 2, and 3 standard deviations to the right. And then we can also be 1, 2, and 3 standard deviations to the left. Same way, just keep subtracting 0 0.9. So 4.2, 3.3, 2.4. Okay. Now, before I answer any of these questions, I'm going to put those same percentages in. Doesn't matter what the data is, what the numbers are. It's still within one standard deviation, 68% of my data which is 34% here and 34% here. Within two standard deviations is 95%, which is an extra 27%, which gives me 13 and a half, 13 and a half. And then the last one is 99.7 three standard deviations and I think that was 2.35 there and there yeah that's that extra 0.7 okay that should make it fairly easy now to answer these questions what percent of the data is between 6 and 6.9 what do you think you can talk. Go. 13.5. What percent of the data is greater than 6.9? Be very careful when you answer this question. Uh, less than that. Okay, i give you a hint. My mean's in the middle, right? So what percent of the data is in, on each side of that mean? It is 2.5% is the correct answer. How did you get 2.5%? Right, great. Awesome. Okay, so what you said was our means in the middle, 50% is over here. Remember, there's an extra little bit that we can't see past this three standard deviation. Same thing over here, extra little bit that we can't see, an extra like 0.15%. We know 50% is here. I'm looking for how much is greater than 6.9. So how much do I have accounted for? 
I've got 50 for sure. Plus another 34, that's 84%. Plus another 13 and a half, that's 97.5. So what's left? 2.5% is on this side over here. Does that make sense? Okay, so there's these extra little pieces on the end that we don't see, but we know that if we're on one side of the mean, either direction, it's 50% at least. So I can add and subtract from that number if I need to. All right, what percent is between 4.2 and 6? That's an easy one. 68%. What percent is less than 4.2? That one's a little trickier. 16 is correct. Yes. Okay, so again, how do we get 16? So if we're looking at how much is less than 5.1, we know, again, it's 50% over here. Take away the 34. 50 minus 34 gives me 16 is below that number. Okay? All right. What percent is between 4.2 and 5.1? Easy one. 34. What percent is less than 5.1? Also an easy one. 50%. That's my mean. Okay, make sense? Any questions on this? Okay. All right. Um, do I want you to try these on your own? Do I want to do them together? That's the question. Why don't you guys try to do that top one on your own? A little graphic there. In the accompanying diagram, the shaded area represents 95% of the scores on the standardized test. If the scores range from 78 to 92, what's the mean and what's the standard deviation? You can work backwards on that one. Get a mean of 85 to start. Okay. 95% of the data is between those two values, which tells us how many standard deviations are we seeing right now. It's 95%. That goes with? Uh, That's uh, three standard deviations. We're at 95. So how many standard deviations out are we? Two. Two, yep. Okay. So there's another standard deviation that we're not seeing here and here. Okay. Um, that standard deviation, you can just take your 85 and your 92 and find the middle of those because our standard deviation as we count up and down is just this constant value that we're using. Um, so what's halfway between 85 and 92 or 85 and 78? 88.5, uh, does that sound right? Okay, and that's enough then to give me my standard deviation. It's three and a half units to the right or to the left of the mean. You can use either side when you do that calculation. Okay, 
Make sense on that one? All right, let's look at the one at the bottom. Test scores are normally distributed with a mean of 76 and a standard deviation of 10. In a group of 230 tests, how many students scored above a 96? I'm going to draw a picture again. Rough sketch here, okay? Normal curve. Mean is, what was my mean? 76. And then I'm just counting up by 10. 86, 96, 106, 66. 56, 46. Okay. Means right in the middle, 76. Nice and pretty because we have standard deviation of 10. All right. In a group of 230 tests, how many students scored above a 96? So before we answer that, let's figure out the percent of students that scored above a 96. So you can superimpose your percentages on there. We've got 34 here. We've got 13 and a half here. We've got 2.35 there. Above a 96, what percent is that? You know, 50s to the left of 76. 2.5 percent, perfect. Okay, here the question isn't stopping there. Then they're saying if there are 230 tests, how many students um, tests are above a 96? So now we're going to take our 230 and we're just going to multiply it by 0 0.025 and figure out what is 2.5% of that. My calculator wants to restart right now. There we go. So about 5.75, which sometimes, depending on how we're answering, this number of tests is going to be a whole number, so we would just round up to around the standard value. Okay. All right, see if you can do the two at the bottom now. Okay, uh, part B, below a 66 is 16% of our data. We've got 50 to the right of 76. There's another 34 between 66 and 76, so 16 left over. 16% uh, of 230 is about 37. Uh, 230 tests, how many are within one standard deviation? We know one standard deviation, we don't even need this chart for that, is 68% of our data. 68% of 230 is approximately 156, if I round to the nearest control number there. Okay. Any questions? Reading our normal curve, our bell curve. Okay. Um, all right. What if the data is not bell shaped? This is not on the back of your paper. Um, we literally only do like one question like this. You take one question on your homework. It is not going to be on test and quiz. So we're not even going to like take the time to write this down. Um, it's called, I like to say Shevashev. I don't know how you actually say that title, but that's how I like to say it. So you can make up your own pronunciation if you want. Um, his theorem says if we have data that is not normally shaped to any other shape of data, we can figure out percentages using the following formulas. Now, K that we use has to be bigger than 1. K represents how many standard deviations you are away from so if k is 2, we're going to use this formula. If k is 3, we're going to use this formula. We do 1 minus 1 over k squared. If you write anything down, if you just want to write that down, that's all you need for like your math Excel question. It tells us what percent of the data is within that type of standard deviation. And it's going to be a little bit bigger than what we see in our normal curve. For example, if we calculate it with 2, if I plug 2 into that formula, I get 75%, which is bigger than the 68 we counted earlier. We give us a little more room for error. 
because we don't know necessarily what the change of the data is. It's just like the other changes. Okay, so it gives us a little bit bigger number, but it only works for standard deviations that are two or three. So you might see a math Excel question that just says use Chebyshev's Chebyshev's theorem to figure out what percent of the data is within like two and a half standard deviations, and you just plug two and a half into that formula, and that's it. That's all we're doing with it. Okay. All right, now this is on your paper. So on Thursday, last time I saw you, we did standard deviation with big charts, okay? There's no way around that. You have to use the big charts. But when we have data like this, there's, uh, I think, 50 pieces of data here, something like that. Imagine how large that column could become, okay? So we do have shortcuts if we have data values that repeat. Now, if they're all the numbers from 1 through 50, there's not really a shortcut. You just got to do it 50 times, and that's it. But we say when we have grouped data, it's kind of like when we had our frequency tables before. We can pick an x value, like this x value, my lowest one would be at zero. And then we count up those frequencies. Um, how many zeros are there? And if I were you, I'd just cross out things as I use them. So how many zeros are here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I've got ten zeros, and then we're going to multiply the x's times our frequencies. I get zero. Okay. Do the same thing for the rest of them. One, two, three, four, five, and six. And let's get all those frequencies. So how many ones do I have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. Multiply one and nineteen, I get nineteen. Twos. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, fourteen. Threes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Again, twenty one. Fours. One, two. Multiply, I get eight. Fives, one, just one. Multiply, I get five. Six is one, two, three, four. Multiply, I get 24. I'm going to sum up my frequencies because that's going to be my n value. 10, 19, 7, 7, 2, 1, 4, 50. More, I need that for later. Uh, I also am going to make a note that this is a sample. Okay, that's going to change our formula in a little bit. All right, now the reason we do our x's times our frequencies is that actually helps us get the mean. This is the numerator of your mean if you add up this column. It's all your data added up, all of the groups of it added up, um, and then we add up all the different values. Okay. So 19, 14, 21, 8, 5, 24, I get 91. So my sample mean, I'll just do that at the top here, my x bar is 91, the sum of all my data values and their frequencies respectively, divided by how many data values I have, 90, or 50, 91 divided by 50 gives me 1.82. Okay, so that's the only reason we do that third column there, it's just to help us get the mean. Okay, so still a little bit of work, but a lot shorter than having to do 50 rows of data on a piece of paper, okay? All right, then we're going to do our deviations and our deviation square, just like before, okay? So deviation and deviation square. All right, so deviation, each of my x values minus the mean. So 0 minus 1.82 is negative 1.82. 1 minus 1.82 is a negative 0.82. 2 minus 1.82 is 0.18. 3, if I subtract it, will give me 1.18. 4, 2.18. 5, 3.18. And 6, 4.18. Okay. Remember, if you sum up your DV, uh, actually, that's not going to work here because we have the frequencies. Don't worry about that. Never mind. All right. Uh, then we're going to square each of them. 1.82 squared, 3.3124. 0.82 squared, 0 0.0, nope, 0 0.6724. 0 
0.18 squared, 0 0.0324, 1.18 squared, 1.3924, 2.18 squared, 4.7524, 3.18 squared, 10.1124, and 4.18 squared. Okay, so we took each x value and found its deviation squared. When we have this group data, though, each x value occurs a certain number of times. So if we did the really big chart with 50 rows, I would have 3.3124 there 10 times because there's 10 zeros. And I would have 0.6724 19 times because there's 19 of those. So in the last column, we just account for how many times the values are going to repeat. We take our deviation squared and we multiply by our frequency. Okay, which is the F column at the beginning. So if I multiply by 10, that's an easy one, 33.124. All right, 19 times 0 0.6724, 12.7756. 0.0324 times 7, 0 0.2268, 1.3924 times 7, 9.7468. 4.7524 times 2, 9.5048. Multiply by 1, it's not going to change for that guy. And then 17.4724 times 4, 69.8896. All right. Sum up that column. And that is the numerator for your variance and standard deviation now. So you guys should be able to finish it from there. Hello. Um, not off the top of my head, but I can try to do something like that. Okay. Let's see here. About 136 for that sum? No. Yes. No. Yes. Oh, some of you look at me like crazy eyes. Yeah? We're okay? No? Oh my gosh. I'll do it again. Oh, how about 145? Does that sound better? Yeah? Okay. I missed the number. That's why I always ask. All right. 145.38. All right. So now, to finish it up, to find our variance, and we're using S's here because it's a sample. So variance is our S squared. It's our sum there, the 145. 0.38 divided by n minus 1, and n is 50, so it's going to be 49. And I get 2.967. That's my variance. My standard deviation is my value of s, and that is just the square root of that big formula or just the square root of our variance, square root of my previous answer is about 1.722. Okay. Still not a short problem. Still pretty tedious. Good news is the math is easy. Okay. Um, and it's a little bit shorter than doing 50 rows of data and having so much repeat. Questions there? Okay, um, the next problem is on your paper. We're not actually even going to do this problem. I just want to mention it. If you have ranges of numbers, we've seen these before, like um, here it's Sunday before traveling, and we've got 400 to 499. There were 60 data values in that group. 
Um, if you're doing standard deviation, we talked about this before, the X value that you're gonna use is the midpoint. So the midpoint of 400 and 499 would be 449.5 would be the value that I use for X. And then the frequency for that value would be 60. Now this problem is a little bit different because we have a group that looks like this, okay? All of our other groups are 100 values. You're 1 to 199, 2 to 299, 3 to 399, less than 100, so 0 to 100. And then we've got this guy that isn't the same size. So the question is, how do we find a midpoint? Because it's really like 500 to infinity. You're just going to follow the patterns of the midpoints that you have already. So if you calculate the other midpoints here, they're all going to be 49.5, 149.5, 249.5, 349.5, 449.5. So for this group, you would just use 549.5. You would just follow the pattern. Again, it's not going to be perfect anyway, because we don't know the exact data values. We just do the best we can to estimate. Okay? All right. Last problem today, you're going to need these two little formulas here. Okay? If you want to just write them in the margin. So this is called a coefficient of variation. Um, it's a way to compare two data sets that are dissimilar, not similar populations, but we might want to compare them for some reason. A coefficient of variation tells us um, how much variance we have in the data. The higher the percentage, the more the data varies. So we can find a coefficient of variation for two separate data sets, and then we compare them. The one with the higher percentage varies. Formulas we're going to use. Um, it's this is for population over here. This is for sample over here. It's the same formula. Again, you just see those different symbols. Population we use the sigma and the mu, and sample we use the s and the x bar. Either way, it's standard deviation divided by mean, um, and then we turn it into a percentage. So you can multiply by 100%, or you can just uh, read the percentage if you want. The value that you have. Okay. Now, you need standard deviation to do this problem, which standard deviation on its own, we just practiced it, is a big, long problem. So sometimes when it comes to problems like this, where calculating the standard deviation is not really the goal of the problem, it's really applying standard deviation, you would be allowed to use a calculator for it. So we're going to use our graphing calculator for this last problem. What I need you to do, let me get mine loaded up. We're going to go into stat like we did before, and we're going to enter this data. Um, this data is heights and weights of members of a basketball team. So heights and weights are different population values or different things that we're measuring, but we want to just see which varies more. All right, so we're going to go to stat. We're going to hit edit. We're going to clear out our lists. Okay, so does everybody have an L1 and an L2 in there still before we go too far here? Yes. Okay, so we're going to put heights in L1. We're going to put weights in L2. So go ahead and take a minute and do that. <clears throat> that looks like we've got 12 of each if you want to check at the end after you've got all your data values in there And just make sure you've got the same amount of values in L1 and L2. You didn't forget anybody. Okay. Good. Did you get it? All right. So now we're going to hit stat. We're going to go over to calculate. Now, before, when we only had one set of data, we used one variable statistics. Now we have two sets of data in L1 and L2, so we're going to use two variable statistics. Number two, you should have L1 and L2 here as a default. Does anybody not have L1 and L2? Great. Go down to where it says calculate. 
And this is going to give you a ton of stuff if you scroll down. It's going to give you all the stats for the X's and all the stats for the Y's. The alternative to this is you put it in L1 and you do it once for the X's, and then you take it out of L1, put the next set of data in L1, do it again. This just gives it to you all at once, which is kind of nice. Um, and we don't need everything off of here, so let me kind of drag what I need over to the side. So that's one bit. I need all the stuff for my X's, and it looks like there's some stuff for my Y's. I need that too. Okay, perfect. All right. One thing I want to take note of is whether this is a population or it's a sample. In this problem, it's telling me it's a population. That tells me which standard deviation to use. Okay, for my X's, and I dragged them on the opposite side, so sorry. <laughs> there is my standard deviation for population, and your mean, it doesn't matter if it uses a sample or if it, you, you won't actually see the population mean symbol on there. The mean formula is the same, whether it's a sample or a population, so you're always going to choose that guy. Okay, and then same thing for the Y's. You can find the standard deviation and the mean, okay? Once you have those, then the coefficient of variation is really quick to calculate. So I'll do the x's first. Coefficient of variation is my standard deviation. I'll give it three decimal places. So 3.295 divided by my mean. 72.75, 3.295 divided by 72.75 gives me 0 0.045, and then remember this is a percentage, that's what the times 100% in the formula means, so the coefficient of variation is about 4.5%. I'm going to move that decimal two spaces to the right. Same thing with the other one. So my standard deviation here is 17.686. My mean is 187.833. Divide them. I get 0.094 or about 9.4%. Now remember, X is represented height and Y is represented weight. Which set of data varies more? What was it? The weight varies more because my coefficient of variation is higher. Okay, again, none of the math we're doing is hard here. It's just knowing what to use when and how to interpret the answers that we're getting. Okay, what questions do you have on standard deviation? <coughs> All right, this is by far the hardest section of the whole chapter, so we're done. So, 2 5 we're going to do tomorrow. That'll wrap it up for us. We're going to do box. Plot. tomorrow and then on Thursday what are we gonna do on Thursday Thursday we're gonna talk about your first project and we're gonna do a little Google Sheet m and m activity on Thursday and then Friday you're gonna start reviewing for your first test which is next week okay all right I'll do cell phone lotto and last five or so minutes are yours remember your two three half x solid two tonight I set it by a day for you Two four is due on Friday night. All right, let's grab. One, two, three, thirty.